computer at CCAP. Um, this is a view series that uh, we've organized for a couple of reasons, but three reasons why we've organized this session is essentially one, to educate um, our ecosystem, particularly in Nigeria and in Africa wide, about um, the venture building model uh, that we operate, and also to expose um, founders, investors, and everyone within the startup ecosystem to what venture building is um, by introducing our colleagues from around the world um, to share their own processes and share um, what they've um, been able to achieve and how that process works for them. And uh, totally for us, it's about um, knowledge transfer because we do believe that for us to build a massive digital ecosystem in Africa, we need to be able to um, transfer the knowledge of being able to systematically build scalable business in, in the technology industry. So um, without wasting so much of our time, today um, we have a very interesting guest in our midst, um, whose um, bio we've probably seen in the different ads that has gone around that has led you to joining us today. Um, the person that we'll be talking to today is the Managing Director of Pioneer Square Labs, uh, PSL for short. Um, his name is T.A. Makan. Uh, he's a serial entrepreneur, um, founder and CEO of Synosis which was acquired by Google. He was also the founder of Gist, which was acquired by BlackBerry. Uh, and a few other startups is a leader in the marketing um, analytics sector. Um, he used to be an entrepreneur in residence at Polaris Venture Partners, uh, Vacuum Capital, where he built uh, Vulcan Labs, uh, Providence Health Services, and also um, investing actively in healthcare and health tech startup ideas. Um, TA has had a couple of exits um, as being founder, advisor, and also um, involved in venture funding. He's also an adjunct professor at the University of uh, Washington Foster School of Business and also an active mentor at uh, Techstars. So um, all of this introduction is to give you a bit of background on who we're talking to today and his vast experience across the startup space and what they do at PSL in helping uh, founders to move their business from the idea stage into proper business that gets exit. And uh, T, it would be interesting to share with you that yesterday was a very interesting news in the uh, Nigerian ecosystem, I think Africa at large. Uh, we had one of the interesting uh, fintech exits that has been acquired by Stripe. Oh, I think you saw the news as well. So um, essentially, the founder is one um, that almost every Nigerian techie or entrepreneur is familiar with his story of how he's moved from um, starting an idea from scratch and taking it into uh, what it became. So today, um, topic is around building from scratch uh, the PSL model. So before we get right into the topic, I would like uh, the TA, um, if you could just give us a brief introduction about yourself uh, so that the audience um, you know, get a feel about what you do at PSL and the PSL journey so far. And then we'll get into the next set of questions where uh, you can walk us thoroughly through how you go about venture building. And thank you for honoring our invitation as well. See you. Yeah, it's great. It's great. Well, thank you. Thanks for having me. You did a great job of, uh, of introduction. Uh, and, you know, I've, I've been doing software startups since 1995. And so now I'm starting to spend more time trying to productize the knowledge that I've had working as either a founder myself or as an investor and sharing that, whether it be with our founders at PSL or founders across the global startup studio or accelerator networks. And so I'm, I'm privileged to, uh, to be part of your group today. Thank you. So I'm happy to talk um, a little bit about the PSL process, uh, you know, how we do what we do. Uh, a little bit about Seattle and what makes Seattle unique and how you'll have to think about your own ecosystem being unique. Um, and then we'll, you know, open it up for lots of questions. And, you know, I, I'll be a lot happier if I'm, if I'm answering the specific questions you have and know that I'm always a resource for you, you know, as, as questions come up in the future. Awesome. So do you want me to do that, that uh, sort of quick yeah, 15, so 20 minute so presentation? Exactly. So it would, it would be great because um, I'm sure like the audience would have a lot of questions um, towards uh, the end of, of your presentation. So I think it would be great for you to walk us through that you know, process um, first and then we can take questions uh, 
right after and we can also aggregate those questions when you're done to, to start asking you. So, but please yeah. go ahead with, with the presentation. Yeah, and, uh, and feel free to throw them in the chat too. I won't pay attention to the chat while we're talking, but uh, oftentimes, you know, I know I have a lot of questions come up and in the flow, and then I can come back to them later on as you prioritize them. So, um, and then to the extent that we don't get to them today, I can answer some of them via email. So feel free to, to throw them into the chat. Okay, so um, a little bit about Pioneer Square Labs. Um, we are based in Seattle and we're based in the oldest part of Seattle, which is actually called Pioneer Square. That is a photo of our building. Um, I have not seen that building since uh, March. Uh, as you know, in the United States, we were one of the first places to have the COVID outbreak. And so we have all been working from home since, since March. That said, you know, PSL was, was very much ready for work from home and work from remote. Um, and so we've actually had one of our most productive years uh, that in our five-year history uh, while COVID has been going on. So to give you a little uh, background, so PSL or Pioneer Square Labs, uh, as I say, we're based in Seattle. We are just had our fifth birthday. Uh, we are 22 people with five managing directors. So MDs like myself, uh, there are five of us, and we have, we have 17 other people. So they sit as software developers, data scientists, go-to-market specialists, operations, um, recruiting, and design. So effectively, everything you need to build a software company uh, we have on staff, and that'll be an important part of uh, what I talk about later. We've actually been very successful in raising money, and I know when I talk to sometimes emerging uh, emerging country uh, sort of areas, like the amount of money that we can raise in a U.S. or a tech center like Seattle is significantly more. So you can factor everything that that I might talk about, you know, based on where we are geographically and how sophisticated or built out our ecosystem is versus your own. But we've raised $27 million for the studio and that money goes toward paying all those 22 people uh, to create those companies. And we also have a side uh, venture fund. So that venture fund of which we've raised 80 million, we're just starting to raise our second venture fund now, uh, invests in the companies as they spin out of the studio. Um, and they also invest in external companies based in our region. So the Seattle region extends a little bit into Portland, Oregon, and up north into Vancouver, Canada. So those are the three major cities that are near us. And we invest exclusively in the Pacific Northwest. So we are, we are very focused on our region at this point in time, both in terms of starting companies and investing in companies. Our focus is B2B SaaS. Um, we also do a bunch of business process automation or BPA, BPA. And almost everything we work on has a pretty significant amount of AI machine learning underneath it. Uh, I would argue that we are, if not the, we're one of probably the three places in the world where the, the largest concentration of, of AI ML specialists are with Amazon, Google, Microsoft. All their cloud services are, are headquartered here in Seattle. Um, and obviously Amazon being as big as they are, attracts Amazon, Microsoft attract a tremendous amount of AI machine learning uh, kind of specialists. We have two different types of ideas that we generate through our studio. We call them entrepreneur led or internally generated. Uh, over the last five years, we've continued to shift more and more to what I would call entrepreneur led ideas. So somebody who wants to be a CEO, founder of a company comes to us with an idea. It's usually usually just themselves, um, and they come to us and we take them through our studio process. In the early days of the studio, we were much more internally led ideas. So we would come up with the idea, we would prototype the idea, we would validate the market, and we would go look for a CEO. Um, we continue to be, and I think in 2021, we'll be more like 80-20, if not 90-10, in terms of entrepreneur-led. Part of that is because we're getting better at finding them, Part of that is we're getting better at vetting them. Part of that is we're getting better in, in an engagement model on how we find somebody and sort of test them out. Um, and I can expand on that in a little bit. But the benefit of entrepreneur-led is they already, they already believe that it's a great idea. And all we have to do is convince them that it is or it isn't versus us trying to, trying to convince somebody that our idea is good. So that's a big learning for us over the last, uh, you know, two, three, four years. Um, 
recently we added our first corporate studio. So you'll see in other studios or venture studios, um, a bunch of them are very focused on corporates um, and co-building with corporates. This is our, we're still, I would say, in experimentation phase. Uh, we launched this with Fortive, which is a large industrial company uh, based here in the Northwest of the United States. And I'll just say Northwest for short. Um, and we are building industrial tech, big data types of things with them. It's still early. We launched our first, we started working with them in April. We launched our first company in May. We launched our second company in August. So we're actually going quite well, uh, but it's, it's a new experimentation for us. And through all of that, like we've done 25 companies. We've done six so far this year. Uh, I think that we'll probably end somewhere between eight and 10. Uh, we've got a bunch of stuff in the studio now. So we've been pretty productive. And so a lot of what I'm going to talk about is, you know, been tested over a relatively long period of time and through many, many uh, companies. Um, you probably know some of the big brands that are, you know, based in Seattle, but the fact of our ecosystem and this region is really important. So you'll notice, you know, some big brands like Amazon and Microsoft, which I assume everyone has heard of, um, and then you'll see other brands here that you may not have known have been built in Seattle, companies like Tableau or DocuSign or Avalara or even Expedia. Uh, so, you know, the, the region here is really important because the very large companies, Amazon, Microsoft, Costco, et cetera, they attract a tremendous amount of talent to Seattle. And oftentimes that talent is two, three, four years in and they're thinking, hey, I want to go do a startup how do I do it? Where could I do it? And we, are, we, we benefit tremendously from the region attracting people who want to do some of the things that we want to build software companies around. So advice for you is think about what the unique parts of your region are. What are the people or big employers who are attracting people who are there? Um, and then nurturing those people who might be senior directors or early vice presidents you know, at those companies who want to be entrepreneurs and attract them through your studio. But our region matters a lot to us. Um, and there's also, you know, sort of subtopics which are emerging here of, you know, business process automation, healthcare, AI, ML, and healthcare um, is another an important part of our specific region. To give you just a snapshot of our companies or our, our major themes, I talked about them earlier. So machine learning and engineering, you know, those are very difficult on the far left, uh, like the gradient reserved. Those are, those for us are usually what we call invention companies. So they usually sit on some top, some piece of very difficult technology uh, that is very differentiated and, and built around that. The middle category of digital transformation are MUNs, which I would call much more staff engineering and marketing. So those are, you know, you just got to build a really great product experience and you have to market it well and you have to figure out really, really good ways of acquiring customers. That's the middle column. And then the far column are things where you look at a large industry that has just not utilized technology, big data, machine learning very well. So Boundless is in immigration. Yesler is in building products in timber. Jet Closing is in the paperwork that goes through closing residential real estate. Remarkably is about, about automating the process of, <clears throat> um, uh, of dealing with uh, buying and selling apartments. Shipium is dealing with logistics. So all the stuff on the right is really about taking things which were offline or old school and bringing them into, you know, this, this current year. And you can see the examples of Seattle companies below each one of them that has similar attributes. Again, making the point that our region matters a tremendous amount. So a little bit about the PSL process. Um, and for all of you who, who may be looking at other studios, you should see some similarity to this, but I think when it gets interesting is, the subcomponents to this. And if you were comparing, you know, how might you do this if you're doing your own startup or how might you do this if you're working with an accelerator or how might you do this with another studio, you'll start to see some of the differences once I put the structure together. So ours is really a five phase process, ideation, validation, creation, spin out and scale up. We make key decisions at each point and we advance the ideas at each point in these following categories. So when we think about any given company, we are looking at these 
attributes um, and those being, you know, market customers, et cetera. So I won't read that. Um, and the, the, the process that we go through, these decision points or the hard lines that are here are really important for us internally um, to advance different ideas. Um, and so the first one is what we call a business brief. This looks like the famed Amazon six pager or the high level investment deck. But for us to move even an idea into the phase called validation, we have to have somebody who has taken some time to write down that business brief, which is customer value proposition, feature set, business model, competitive landscape, in the beginning of how might this product be monetized, as well as like what are the biggest issues of this given company. And every company has their big issues, most of which we want to go test through validation. All of them are going to have a how are we going to find and acquire customers but many of them have a tech risk. Some of them have a competitive risk. Some of them have an investor risk. Um, and so we're outlining and prioritizing those as part of that business brief. And in order for an idea to advance, you have to have one or more MDs like myself that are excited about the idea, that can imagine themselves on the board, that can imagine catalyzing this idea. We then, the next big decision for us, and I'll get into some of the details around validation and you know, each phase, but is really, once we have an entrepreneur that we want to back, that is mapped to a managing director, that is mapped to PSL, and we are excited that there is a venture scale opportunity with a person that we want to back and that they like the process and the economics of PSL. This is the point in time when we talk about how much PSL is going to own and how much the entrepreneur is going to own. This is the part in time when we talk about, are you ready to go be the CEO of a venture scale business? Do you know what that means? Have you done enough strengths and weaknesses? And do we think that this is a big enough opportunity for all of us to spend the next five or 10 years of our lives trying to create a big company? So this is a very important decision point for us. It also is when we start to put significant resources uh, against a project. So it's still a project, uh, but we start usually at that point in time putting engineering, uh, design, and we are on a path toward turning this into a company. The next big decision is called the spin out decision. Um, and this is sort of a refinement of the, uh, the first, the previous decision, which is, okay, now we know a lot more. We probably have a working prototype. We probably have a set of customers who want the product. Um, they've sort of started to give really strong indication of willingness and ability to pay. And we make the decision. We're like, okay, we are now backing Jane to go do this company in the way that she wants to. And we have pretty high confidence that we're going to be able to get this company out into the market and fund it. At that point in time, like our, uh, our operations teams text takes over and we are on a path toward actually creating the company, which then gets to the day of founding. And the founding day is really important because on the left-hand side of founding is when, uh, you know, that person is just an entrepreneur in residence. They're just working as an employee of PSL. On the right side of that, they're now the CEO of a brand new company. And our relationship changes as well. So on the left-hand side, all of the resources we're putting against it are effectively paid for by PSL. On the right-hand side, if the CEO wants to keep our resources, they effectively use us like an agency. And then we are all driving toward getting to VC funding, which is the next big horizon. And at that point in time, you know, we bring more capital into the company. They are scaling up um, and it starts to feel and look like a, re a regular startup. And in the essence of time, I won't go through each one of these, but the, you can see that if you just take the customer line, we will think about at the early parts of validation is who's the ideal customer profile, where will we find them, how will we get them, and how can we drive them to VOC, which we call voice of customer, and how do we use that as all in our learning. As we've going through validation into creation, we would basically say, let's take a subset of those people that we talked to that we found and start to move them toward, are they going to be our first early adopter customers or customer development? And then you move into spin out, which is traction of, can we go from people who said they would pay to actually being paying customers? Can we go from having a very lumpy and not very predictable revenue curve to a very predictable revenue curve? And that's what we would do. And you could imagine each one of these horizontal lines goes from very vague to very specific as the company is uh, moves through our overall process. 
And then with regard to funding, it's a very common question is, our studio and our fund work together here. So on the first day of the company, um, we put in, whoops, we put in 300K into the company, $300,000 into the company, and they use that to start hiring their first employers, employees, and they use that to, um, you know, pay our resources as long as they want to keep them. Depending on the funding strategy of the company, sometimes they go from that 300K straight to a VC funding where our fund puts more money in alongside them. Sometimes they want longer periods of time. And so we'll, we'll invest on our own another 500, 700K while they're on their path to VC funding. But everybody is really working toward how do we get the company to have externally led venture funding, you know, as soon as possible. So at the end of the day, and I'm going to go through these kind of quickly is, you know, all of this is about people and whether it's talking about people at the PSL level or the founders or our investors, there's so much of this, which is about people and who the specific people are. So each one of our studios and we're part of, you know, a group which has many, many different studios. Each studio is a reflection of who the people are and where those people work and what they want to do. So in our particular case, you know, I'll, I'll like people, 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 people um, is so, so critically important. But in our case, you know, we have people supported by other concepts. So timelines, templates, and teamwork. So the timeline I just sort of walked you through, each one of those components, whether it be customer discovery or software development or operations, for us has a template. We know what we, we can do over and over and over again. And in many ways, those templates um, are helpful both in terms of getting predictability in our model, but also adding value to the entrepreneur. And then last but not least is teamwork. So an idea for us usually starts with just the MD and the entrepreneur in residence and what we call a business lead. That's it. That's the early team. And then slowly but surely, like a snowball, it gathers momentum over time. You start to add design, software development, data science, operations, recruiting, and that teamwork and coordinating that on the timeline with the templates is a really important part of our overall process. We also have a lot of, whether it be a template or a process that we've translated into playbooks. So a great example of this is fundraising. So we have a very, we've, I mean, across our team, if you add up all of the companies that have been started, um, our 22 people have started over 45 companies. Um, more than half of our team have been founders. Um, we've, all, we've all raised a ton of money either for our own companies or for other companies. And so fundraising is something that can be productized. It can be playbooked. You can think about what is it going to happen on week one, two, three, four, five as you move into active fundraisings. Um, and so we have playbooks for a number of different components. And in certain cases, we take those playbooks and we actually turn them into products. And I use that term loosely, but we have software that we've applied to turn a process into a product so that we can do it more and more efficiently, um, more repeatedly and with greater scale. And I'll give a couple of examples in a minute. And then the last is um, how do we make decisions? So as you think about your own studio or your own startup for that matter, how you make decisions is so critical. And we obviously, all of us would like to think about what data do we use to make which particular kinds of decisions. So I showed on that, on the PSL process, you know, how do we make a decision at the early parts of, do we want to work with this entrepreneur? Is this an interesting enough category of an idea before we refine the whole idea? And at each one of those key stages, we are making different decisions about the process. We also have a significant amount of dissent. And dissent in our case would be one MD who says, you know, on a scale of one to 10, I'm a two on this idea, but I'm a six on this entrepreneur. Um, what do we do with that? So if I'm an eight on the idea and an eight on the entrepreneur, but my partner is a two on the idea, how do we get through that process? Oftentimes it is about data and decisions, but we encourage sort of dissent and respectful sort of discussion around each one of those. But decision-making is something that is so critical. And the more people you have involved in it, you get stronger 
different kinds of opinions, but you also make it more difficult to make decisions itself. So I could get into some of our decision-making process uh, later if that's interesting. So I've, I've, this is my last sort of slide. So the making of the machine, um, I'll just give you a few examples of some of the process. So I gave you one, which is our ideation validation process. We also have really gotten very, very good at weekly cadence. So I'm hitting this, how do we move processes through? So we work, we work Monday to Friday, every Friday, every single project effectively has a quick review. We do that in slides on, we reallocate resources and every week we have a known set of what are we going to achieve on which particular projects, who's in charge of that. And we've gotten pretty good at that weekly cadence. We also force along the broader process I spoke about these things that we call deep dives. Um, and deep dives are means by which you gather a focused amount of people inside the studio to work on a particular problem. For example, a company is selling into the enterprise and it's really expensive and you need four different people to make a decision. What's the most efficient way? Where have we done that better in the past? How could we accelerate the decision making for company X and the way that they're going to market? And those deep dives are focused working sessions that drop along, you know, the weekly cadence. We have a number of playbooks. So one is validation. And if you talk to lots of other studios, we are probably best known for our validation process. We've brought a tremendous amount of software technology and automation to all the things you would read in things like Lean Startup. So when we want to go from an idea to a landing page, to a survey, to a voice of customer, to a set of outreach and programmatic using you know, Google or social channels, like we've made all that both a playbook and a process and a product in certain cases. So that's our validation framework is framework and approach is sort of well known in studio uh, studios. We have a playbook for diversity. So um, in Seattle and the United States, for sure, diversity, equity, and inclusion is a very important topic. Many founders end up looking like me and we are working very hard to end up with many founders who don't look like me. So women, underrepresented minorities, black, Latin founders, um, and people from very different backgrounds. So we, we not only are looking for that at a founder level, but we are also, regardless of who the founder is, helping them to build diverse teams from day one. And we have a playbook for, for how they do that. I mentioned fundraising. We also have a pretty sophisticated, how do we launch a company and how do we support it with, with PR? And in certain cases, we've actually productized our ideas um, into things that we use that feel like software products. So Spartan, Prospector, and Spider are all three internal products that we use to accelerate our learning. So Spartan is basically automating digital demand gen um, across social channels, social, social and search channels. Prospector is effectively automating the outbound uh, demand gen on LinkedIn. Spider is a product that we're building right now, which lets us all authenticate into LinkedIn, search all of our networks to find out who we might know who could either be customers, investors, or team members, automatically put that into a Google Sheet. Then you get a notification that says, who, how well do you know this person and can you make an introduction? And then we automate that whole process. So this is leveraging professional networks to gain customers, investors, or teams. And in one, one of these cases, we've actually turned it into a spin out. So single file um, is one of these internal processes that became a playbook, that became a product, that actually became a company. And what single file does is all the registration that you need to do to start a company, to make a Delaware-based company, or in the United States, at least, as you start to sell in other states, depending on what you sell and how you sell it, you have to register, you have to fill out paperwork, you have to pay taxes, and so single file basically automates that whole process. So single file is an interesting example because it's, it's much of what we, you know, it sort of wraps up a lot of PSL all in one, which is we are very much about process playbooks and products. We are about business process automation. We are about using software to gain competitive advantage. And we're about enabling and using that software to create and enable competitive advantage for other people all around the world. So with that, I'll stop sharing and I'm, I'm totally open to uh, taking questions. Awesome. Thank you so much, uh, TA. That was a very impressive uh, walkthrough of uh, the, the PSL process. And um, 
every time I see you give presentation, like I keep having that first encounter we had um, over the GSSN roundtable around Sparta. Um, I think that was the tool that brought um, brought me so much in love with how you guys build, right? Because um, essentially, I think one of the critical points of venture building is being able to validate businesses fast and knowing which businesses to keep on supporting and which businesses to sort of like take offline. And uh, before, the, okay, I think there's a question rolling in, but before um, we go into the questions, I have uh, three questions centered around this validation concept, um, founder relationship with um, studios, and also in terms of um, how do you know an idea is a win and how you go about uh, picking that win and reducing um, you know, the resources that um, allows you to put them into the market. So the first one essentially is, you know, maybe you go into detail about that validation process because when people talk about validation today, um, it's just a, sort of like a buzzword being thrown around. But um, you have a very methodological, um, you know, almost clinical process around how you validate. <laughs> Perhaps you want to like just share a quick uh, one or two minutes around Sparter and how that helps you roll out uh, ventures that you can almost make a bet on to be successful. Yeah. So in many ways, it depends. It depends on what kinds of companies you're doing. So we are we build software only companies, um, and we are focused on venture scale software companies. Right. These are ones that are going to be good enough to be billion dollar companies. I mean, when we start, we think they're all good enough to be billion dollar companies. Um, one rule of thumb would be, you know, how do you get to a hundred million dollars in revenue and still have less than 10% of the market and preferably smaller percentages or even bigger numbers. So that's, that's one rule of thumb. Um, and we are, you know, we do a light level of financial modeling, which says, you know, how many customers do I need to pay me how much money over what amount of time in order for me to create that type of revenue. But as you ask the question about Spartan and really all three of the tools, whether it's Spartan, Prospector, or Spider, are all about how do we find early customer traction. And we spend a disproportionate amount of time, most of our companies, of the validation process, probably 75% of it is on customer discovery, customer development. And it's really, can we find people who A, care, and B, who are willing, who have the ability and willingness to pay that has strong ROI based on what, we, what value proposition we're delivering? And can we do that in sufficient numbers and sufficient levels of consistency? So a good sort of rule of thumb for us is, let's say we're doing a B2B software company. We would say, we wanna try to, re, we, first we want idea, a, a real definition of ICP, ideal customer profile. And we tend to be pretty narrowly focused. We add, add lots and lots of attributes to the ICP. So it's not just a manager of a hospital. It's like a hospital with how many beds that has how many MRI machines that has a percentage of those MRI machines that go down on a certain level of time that cost the max amount of money. Oh, okay. That's a, it's a pretty narrow definition, but there are probably still many hundreds, if not thousands of people who fit that definition. So a lot of of our early part, so imagine a four week long validation process. Week one is really refining like, is it one ICP? Is it two ICPs? Which one's better? Can we get enough momentum on any one of those? And our, our internal target would be, can we go outreach to 50 of them? So part of it is like, can we go find 50 people who meet that ICP? And if so, what result do we get? So do zero of them click through and go to a landing page or say, hey, call me or like, yeah, totally happy to get on the phone. Or do 10 of them do that? So 10 would be high, you know, anything like below five, you're like, hmm, something's wrong here. Like either the ICP doesn't care, we're asking the wrong thing, we're not saying it right. But in general, we're trying to get somewhere between five and 10. And if you get more than 10, okay, now you're starting to like, everyone's starting to smile a little bit. That's phase one, imagine the funnel. Then you get those 10 people on the phone of the 50 that you outreach to, you're doing voice of customer interviews and you're really testing on very quick value prop, feature set, like what is the initial product and then business model. And that's the area where most people don't spend enough time, which is how much will you pay miss customer for this thing, assuming it works. And if you're gonna pay us you know, $10 a month for this thing or $1,000 a month or $10,000 a month for this thing, how will you justify ROI internally? 
So a lot of work on the business model or ability and willingness to pay and ROI. And I just picking a B2B, a B2B example because more than half of our portfolio is B2B. Again, it matters a lot on what kinds of companies you're choosing because your validation process may be different depending on the type of company you're choosing. Like a B2C company or a free, a freemium kind of a company or a, you know, an enterprise kind of a company, all different price points, different buying cycles. But for us, it's really about the funnel of can we get and find real customers? And each one of the metrics that we track along the way are important. Like how many people are seeing the ad? How big is the audience that out there? How many people are clicking through? How many people are giving us their email address? How many people are filling out a survey behind the email address? How many people are scheduling the call? What do those people say on the call? Um, and all of those metrics, which we are, tend to be tracking on week one, week two, week three. By the end of week three, we start to get pretty good indication, either positive or negative. We're like, meh, it's okay. Or it's not that good or well, like it's really good on any one or all of those metrics. Um, and the customer pull is so important for us. Um, and where we've been great, there've been very, very strong pull, clear value prop, people want it, there are enough of them and we prioritize those kind of projects. And I could go on on for, you know, a few more hours about the other sub components to it, but I think you get the, the gist of, of how we do that. Of course, and, and the reason I asked that question really is that, um, again, is that sort of like clinical approach uh, when you were talking about people and the templates and the playbook? I think uh, that is one of the ingredients of the studio model and in speaking of the studio model, like you said, the, the magic for PSL is, is, is the validation process, right? So I do think that for a lot of startup, going through that process and iterating constantly um, would be quite expensive, I believe. And so having you know, an automation process that sort of solves that, and not just because it's a tool, but it's because it's behind um, a playbook and that makes absolute sense. Um, so I've got two questions um, from our listeners, and one of them is, how do you, okay, so it's, um, what is the average time to market from ideation to MVP, which for you, it's a spin out, right? So what is the, um, you know, average time to market? And the second question, which I'll just lump three of them together is, um, it says, you have uh, five managing directors at PSL. Can you explain why so many people and how do you all operate? And uh, the last one is talking about really how do you select or find the ideas that, that you roll out out of your studio? Yep. Um, so I see them in the chat, so I'll take them one at a time. So in terms of the fastest, and I'll call it the median, and when it starts to feel slow. So we did our fastest company was four weeks from idea to spin out. Now, that was, that was one that just like everything went right. Like we picked the right idea, we picked the right market. There was a lot of pull in the market. There weren't a lot of other solutions and it, the product was pretty simple to build and get out. So four weeks, really fast. A more normal company would be three or four weeks in validation and four to six weeks in creation. If you remember our phases, so call that two, two and a half months. That's pretty typical for us. If, we've, if we're in creation for more than two months, we probably didn't do something right. Meaning we, we, we either picked too big of a product, meaning it was too, like we had, should have narrowed it down, should have been easier to build. Um, or for whatever reason, like our validation of customers didn't pan out as well as we thought. You know, we talked to five people, they all said they wanted it. And by the time we talked to number six, seven, eight, nine, and 10, they were like, meh, not really. So like we got all excited a little bit ahead of ourselves. So sometimes... The validation in an optimal case is like four, five, if it's more than six weeks for us, we start to ask ourselves the question, like, what are, what are we getting wrong here? Um, and if it's, um, unless there's a you know, significant pivot on the idea, right? It's like, hey, I learned something in week two, I'm basically restarting all the way again, which is, you know, this, it's the same customer, but it's entirely different product value prop and business model thing, or it's the same product and entirely different customer base so there's certainly sometimes that pivots happen in the, um, in the validation process, but, but not that often. There's refinement, but not what I would consider to be a big pivot. You know, mo most often we're into three, four weeks, 
we're like, hey, we tried this one, we tried this one, we tried this one, like mm, the dog isn't hunting and we're just, you know, we're going to kill that idea. So we, we're pretty good about that and it's emotional and sad because you every, every day that you start validating, you like want to work um, and you start with your hypothesis because, you know, they're not free. It's not free to validate an idea. It takes time and it's really opportunity cost and it's real cost to do that. Um, so the question uh, from Ibrahim on, you know, how do we find and select ideas for your portfolio? So um, I'll say that's from three different perspectives. So one is I showed you the kinds of things that we like, right? That we understand B2B SaaS, business process automation, AI ML, automating, you know, old industries with new software. Um, each one of us as managing directors has sort of sub areas that we care a lot about. Like one of my partners is really, really de deep in marketing technology. I like quantified health things. Um, so I know that space really well. And so when I see an idea, I have better expertise on judging, you know, an idea and an entrepreneur. So we have kind of, I'll call it the thematic approach. The second is the entrepreneur oriented approach. Like, oh my gosh, like this person is amazing. Like we have to start a company with this person. Um, and in best case, you have those two things fit together. Um, and outside of that, every now and again, though, I think this is probably our least successful way to do it is we have an invention. So we have a very, very strong experienced senior software team. And every now and again, they invent something super cool. And that super cool is sometimes a solution looking for a problem. But we have started companies where we just take the solution and keep looking around in different problem spaces to see where it fits. And sometimes that resonates. Uh, but that, I think it's, if I had to prioritize, it would be, oh my gosh, the entrepreneur is the one and we work ideas with them. And if they're awesome, then they're good at making their own decisions. They're good at using our validation framework. They're good at understanding data. And therefore they will ultimately themselves with our help, get us to a, an idea that we're excited about. Um, the next would be, as I said, sort of, categories that we care about. Um, and then the third being, I'll call it inventions. And then the next question was, PSL has five managing directors. Can you explain why so many and how they all operate? So um, we have two, you know, we have two real entities. We have the venture fund and one of my partners, she spends probably 90% of her time on the venture fund. So now say there's four of us who are very focused on the studio. Now all of us spend a little time on the venture fund too. We do external investments. So maybe, maybe we have up to 20% of our time, but we have four MDs that are working pretty hard on the, on the studio side. That's not for the, for the size and scale of our team. It's not too far off the norm. I mean, a lot of, a lot of studios will have two, three, you know, MD function type people. Um, but each one of us would be in charge of, probably one or two studio projects at any given time. Um, and we are trying to move those through the, through the studio and those take a bunch of time and every phase takes more and more time. Um, we end up sitting on lots of boards. So as we spin all those 25 companies out and we have to go get them funded, like there's a bunch of time that's is how do you get those companies to go well? The companies that spin out probably 25% of them don't go that awesome right? Now you have to go and effectively restart or we call jumpstart, you know, companies that are in there or make a lot of difficult decisions on letting a company die, you know, that's out in that spin out phase of which we've killed two companies that we did spin out, that we didn't keep funding, that we let die. That's hard. Um, we have, you know, tried to fix companies that are out in the scale up phase that takes time. And then we also spend a significant amount of time on the recruiting side, so how do we find the next 10 people who are going to go do companies with us? How do we vet them? How do we onboard them? How do we test ideas? How do we offboard them if it doesn't work out? So the four of us, which is me, Mike, Greg, and Jeff, um, the four of us have pretty similar, you know, day jobs as it were in terms of the categories that we, that I talked about. Each one of us has a subcategory, I would say. So I'm a mechanical engineer. I'm a founder operator like all the processy stuff I just talked about, like that's mostly me. And, and Greg has been a venture capitalist and Greg and Jeff have been a VC for 20 years. When we want to build an investor target list, like we get Greg and Jeff involved, like that's their sub area. When we look at um, 
on sort of founder CEO groups and supporting them. That's kind of like me and Mike. And each one of us have kind of a, I'll call it an operational component on how we run the business. And then Greg and I have been spending a bunch of time on the corporate studio. So each one of us, but Mike and Mike and Jeff have spent zero, effectively zero time with our corporate studio. Um, thank you so much, uh, TA. I think there is one um, other question that just popped in. It said, how do you decide um, whether to pivot an idea or to kill it? And uh, what makes an idea worth pivoting or killing um, in your own opinion? Yeah, as, we, yeah as, as we've moved toward more and more entrepreneur-led ideas, um, the pivot or kill is data supporting the decision. And then it might be what I would call a double kill. So we don't like the idea and we don't like you. So thanks very much, but we're not going on. I did one of those this week because the person just wasn't strong enough to lead an idea um, in our opinion. And, you know, a lot of this is just some blend of objective and subjective decision making. And it's not just one person, but it'd be like, hey, Greg, like, I don't know, like, what do you think about Jane? Like, is she good enough? And if you're asking yourself, like, is she good enough, independent of the idea, she's probably not. Or she's not experienced enough. Or she's going to have to come back with a better founder idea fit. Or she's just going to have to do more work. And that, you know, it's objective and subjective decision making. So oftentimes the, the, idea to pivot or kill is the managing director sitting with the CEO or EIR and saying, okay, we've been working on this for N number of weeks. We've done Y number of customer calls. We've got Z number of click through. What do we think there's a business here? Do we think there's a venture scale business here? And, and, and if the answer from the EIR is like, absolutely yes. And I'd say, great. Like what data do you have to support your absolutely yes? So, if they're not good at making that decision, then it's already you're calling into question the leadership. So prior, part of that validation is validating the person, their own ability to lead and, and make good decisions, their ability to com create compelling narrative. So oftentimes we would kill the idea or call it pivot the idea, but we still wanna do another one with the person. I've been working on one idea with this one entrepreneur for a year and a half. We've been through four different ideas. Um, we got very close on two of them and like, I so want to start a company with her and I'm willing to continue to put some level of resource against trying to help her start a company. So it's in, in many ways the idea, but the long answer to your question is almost always it is kill because we can't find customer interest and we've done so many of them. Now we have a pretty good comparative number at each stage of the funnel. Like how many people are out there? How many people saw the ad? How many people clicked through it? How many people signed up? How many people filled out a form? How many people got on the call? How much consistency we get? The funnel of customers. And there's oftentimes, you know, like clear winners. And you're like, that's a good idea. That's an idea that people want. And there's ones that are like, uh, and there, there are lots and lots of them where we're like, yeah, they might be out there, but we can't find them. So customer, 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 customer is almost always why we kill an idea. I, I get it. So um, another question, I think we'll just take this last two questions so that we could uh, wrap up. Um, it says, how big is the problem? Um, that is the market size that interests your studio. And is there a minimum market size that you look at towards, uh, you know, biting out of? Yep. Yeah. So, um, we are big believers in, in sort of three things. So when we think about market size in quotes, we think about TAM, like total addressable market, like how many people are out here who kind of look like this ideal customer profile multiplied by what we believe they will pay, pay for it. Okay, so that's a, what I would call a bottoms up TAM, right? You build it by pretty simple math of like those numbers, like there's 10 million people who we think will pay $10 for this thing. Okay, like that's one way to build it. Oftentimes, emerging technology is the market isn't out there yet, but you're betting very hard on the trend. So it's TAM times trend. And, um, and you have to, if you, if you have a small TAM, total addressable market, then this, the trends need to be that much stronger. And 
and more quantified too. Like, okay, yeah, of course there's a trend toward machine learning. Got it. Yeah. But the, what is the trend on how fast a computer can identify a cat in a photo and how cheap is it going to be five years from now? And okay, that's a trend. And you know, it's going to continue because it's already on that. And there are, you know, hundreds of other trends that you could look at. So if you're saying I'm building a machine learning or computer vision based thing that does X, where if I could get it to this price point, then there's a lot more people who want to pay $10 a month for it. So TAM times trend. And we're, we're not really market size investors per se. We are very much, can I build a model that supports a big enough business? that has the appropriate level of trend before I get into who else is going to come and eat my lunch from a competitive perspective. But you know, like in the early days, you'd say like take Twilio, for example, and you'd say, okay, well, how big was the market for Twilio when they started? And I know Jeff Lawson from only three guys in the garage. And you'd say, Hmm, I don't know, but is the trend in the right direction? Is mobile notification going to be an important thing that developers want? And you'd say like, mm, I think the trend's pretty strong there. And is this a pain in the ass for developers to do? And if they can do it well and they can make it easy and they can make it inexpensive enough, then developers all over the world and applications all over the world will probably want to include those types of things and they'll want to do it on a global basis and Twilio is a good enough answer to do it. Like that's how we would have built sort of the idea there. And you'd say, well, how many developers are out there and which kind of apps are out there? And in the early days, you wouldn't exactly know, but you'd bet pretty heavily on a trend like that um, to say, and oh, by the way, Jeff Lawson is amazing. And his vision for the future and the way that he thinks about it and the way he characterizes what's going to happen in year one, two, three, four, five, that's, that becomes the important part. And I think that's a very interesting way to, to look at that because um, I think one of the reasons why we find the studio model very interesting is that building models for um, what we call the middle market is a better way to, to look at how big a startup could go from, you know, idea into, you know, spin out from, from a studio. Because obviously, once you can find that unit economics, find the next cost, um, the right customer base, uh, find the right trend to hop on, um, you can keep iterating to the market sort of sees that same opportunity that you're trying to plug into the market. I think that makes absolute sense. Uh, there's a question, though, that I think it's a very interesting one that we could wrap up with. Um, while the studio model might increase the chance of um, high growth um, um, companies being uh, spun out, how do you analyze the companies that do not go out of the studio, the ones that fail? Do you do some sort of like post uh, uh, post debt analysis uh, for those companies? And how do you sort of catalog um, your learnings um, towards um, the next few, uh, companies that you ship out. I know you mentioned something around the validation, how you could sort of like compare and go back to, but for the sake of the question, could you just walk us through the companies that you've killed and how you've learned from those companies? Well, I think it's, it's important to think that there are companies that die at every one of those big decision points, right? They, there's lots of them that never make it past the brief. You're like, yeah, not, not, not even going to validate this one. Um, there are, many, many ideas that die at the end of validation for the reasons I decided. There's a relatively few that die in creation because we've already done all the work up front, but every now and then they do. Um, and, you know, every time, a, and, then, and then obviously there's a few that die between founding and funding. Um, and there were two, we had two this year. One I think was a definitely a situation of fundraising in COVID. They went out to raise money in February and it was very difficult to raise capital at that point in time. And we didn't, like, we screwed up the fundraising strategy. Like, who knew about COVID? But, like, that's why that company died. We had another company that died where we had a mismatch between the vision for the company and the fundraising strategy for the company, the CEO, and me. I was on the board of that, the, comp the second company that died. And he wanted to do it one way and I thought that was the wrong way. And like, he didn't want to go raise money from other people and we didn't want to keep funding the vision he had. So we we're like, okay, well, it's your company. Like you got to get it funded. And like, like we're not believing in the vision that you have. And if I, you know, I do a full retrospective, I could have seen that way back earlier. Um, did we really agree on the strategy, especially as it relates to milestones and fundraising? Um, and I think that's a learning. So, and then you get into some of our companies, like we have one that's being kind of aqua hired right now. Yep, didn't do enough go to market. Like didn't do enough 
like start signing customers on day one. Like we built and built and built. It became a very engineering heavy company. The product became very big, became very expensive, difficult, therefore to sell, didn't get a lot of customer traction, you know, run out of money. So we do a lot of retrospective on the successes and the failures. In fact, we just had our big kind of quarterly sort of team meeting where we literally do this. Like, what did we learn from that one? That was successful. What did we learn? Well, what did we learn from this one? And so we're tending to do retrospectives on anything that moves till the end of validation, you know, validation, creation, spin out, scale up, anything that happens very positively, very negatively in either of those cases we are doing, we are doing retrospectives and saying, what can we learn? How do we do it better? Awesome. And, and that is, um, thank you so much, T.A. Um, as a bonus, uh, my own question to you is, uh, what is a PSL's most successful startup to date? And, you know, can you just walk us through how it's performing and um, what makes you so excited about that? And then we'll call that a wrap for today. Yeah, it's a little bit, it's a, it's, I won't dodge it, but it's a little bit hard because you're like, I love all my children equally, right? Like, which one's your most successful child? Um, and when you have 25 of them, it's a little bit hard. Um, but I will pick I will pick one that is in the category of probably most successful from a bunch of different metrics, and that's Boundless. So, so what Boundless does is it automates the process of applying for um, immigration status in the United States. That is a very difficult thing to do. It's a lot of paperwork. You're never sure if you're filling it out. It's a very critical decision for people. And oftentimes it's people who are English is their second language. And oh, by the way, our current administration has made it much more difficult for people to apply for legal immigration in the United States. We tested this product. We tested it well with all of our Spartan digital marketing stuff. It tested very well. Tested very high on our sort of click-through rates. People really wanted it. They wanted to get on the phone. They wanted to talk about what, what could be better about this. That's one. So tested very well. Two is we found incredible founder idea fit. So Xiao Wang, he's a Chinese immigrant, worked at Amazon, launched the Amazon Go stores, had experienced this problem himself with his family. He's also quite charismatic. Um, and we partnered him with his other co-founder, a guy named Doug Rand, who wrote the immigration policy for President Obama. So we had a deep domain expert who understood Washington, who understood what was going on, partnered with a charismatic, incredible founder idea fit type of founder. Next, um, that company is, you know, went on to automate a process which people understood, which placed high value on it, where we could apply light levels of machine learning. And both, how do we make it more predictable? How do we make it more uh, easier for the user? What we would all feel like a consumer online experience, kind of like TurboTax. You know, like filling out your taxes used to be paperwork. You're never sure where the errors were. You're worried about getting audited by the IRS. Can we now do that in an automated way? So Boundless has now gone on to raise a couple of rounds of funding, incredible investors. We just acquired our largest competitor. And by acquiring our largest competitor, with that funding, we also got five more products, which are effectively just different forms of immigration. So spousal immigration or this type of immigration, all the different forms that people have to sort of fill out. So, you know, the core components there is an idea that tested well, where customers really wanted it, where you had strong idea founder fit, um, and you executed really well through our model that we understand, which is really B2B SaaS customer acquisition, business process automation, great product user experience, software supported by humans who are making it smarter. And you know, Boundless is also one, I'll make this last point, is many of the best companies, the CEO can answer this question well, which is how is the world a better place when my company is successful? And if you can answer that question now, you may have differences of your opinion of whether legal immigration is good or bad, but assume that you think that legal immigration is a good thing, then answering that question is very compelling. And I think a CEO who can answer that question well will attract better people to come work for them, will attract a market that wants to follow them, will attract press that wants to follow them, will attract customers who believe in what they're trying to do because it's not just about making money or making software or getting return for investors. It's about making the world a better place with software, with startups, with entrepreneurship. And I 
I encourage most CEOs, founders, or otherwise say, you know, even for us, we're all doing studios. How is the world a better place if we're successful? Well, we help lots of entrepreneurs who, you know, 80 or 90% of them fail. We help a lot fewer of them fail. We help the ones who have a good idea to, to accelerate into the market better. We bring best practices, not just in one or two categories, but many different categories. And we can b- bring best practices from around the world, whether I'm sharing to you or you're sharing back to me, and productize that in a way that the next person can think about diversity from day one. They can think about better social acquisition. They can think about better financial reporting. They can think about better fundraising so that ultimately all these talented people who want to start companies, start companies that work, not, st- not companies that fail. Awesome. Thank you so much, Tia. And I think that brings us to the end of today's session. Thank you so much, all our guests that has been able to join us and stay to the end. We really appreciate your time and particularly the time of our guest. Um, pretty exciting. Every time I hear you speak, um, you've you know, pretty much broken down the process that we use over here. And I'm always consistently learning from you and the community of venture builders around the world. Um, we will be doing the same um, session with another interesting um, CEO um, in about two weeks from now. We'll be sharing that update across our social media network and our website. Um, the idea, again, for us is to help people build better um, ventures, um, both here in Nigeria and in Africa, um, you know, all together as a continent, and to bring uh, that best practice from people who have done it successfully uh, from around the world. And until next time, uh, thank you, everyone, and do have um, a wonderful rest of your week, um, weekend, rather. Um, thank you to you as well. Um, and that's thank it for you. us. Cheers. Bye. Thank you, guys. Awesome. Keep it up.